ahead and um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ariel. I work with Kansas City Teacher Residency. Uh, I'm an operations and communications associate. Um, and, and I recently just joined Kansas City Teacher Residency in um, June. Very excited <clears throat> to be on the team. I'm very excited for the work that we're doing in Kansas City. Uh, and then I also have um, my teammate on with me uh, as well as, actually I have two teammates on with me as well as our other special guests, which will be joining us very shortly. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and let Andrea, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Andrea Bright Harrell. I'm the, uh, also a communication and operations associate with KCTR. And so we are so excited to be talking about Hispanic Heritage Month today um, and excited to have a few of you here live with us. We'll be interviewing a couple of um, uh, people in the community and one of our very own. Um, so if you have any questions today, I'll be monitoring our chat um, and can ask some questions live of our um, guests. So ask away about um, Hispanic Heritage Month um, education in Kansas City. And we have one other. Yeah, um, and Jessica, if you would like to introduce yourself as well. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't know if I should go. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Garcia. I am a current continuum coach at KCTR. I just, similar to Ariel, I just joined staff this year. Previously, I taught uh, middle school ELA here in Kansas City at Kansas City Girls Prep Academy. I taught fifth and then sixth grade ELA there in humanities. And then before that, I did teach for America and taught in New York City for a couple of years. Um, sixth and seventh grade ELAs. Um, and I identify as Latine, Hispanic, Latinx. I'm sure we'll get into those terms at some point during this live. Um, and I specifically identify as Mexican American and that identity is really important to me, um, both when I was an educator in the classroom and my role now as a continuum coach and especially during Hispanic Heritage Month. And so I'm really excited to dive into all that that is and what that means to me um, today. Awesome, thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, and so I'm just gonna kind of give a brief overview. Like Jessica and Andrea said, um, we are gonna be talking about Hispanic Heritage Month, um, what resources, any type of mis misconceptions um, and how to basically navigate through that uh, within the education space. And then just in general um, through like through life as well, um, how students are identifying and how to honor uh, those identities. And then also just, um, like I said, different resources and different um, like organizations and, and different things that are happening in Kansas City during this time as well. And then just always, it's always a great time. So, yeah, um, that is what we're going to be talking about today. And um, so, yeah, uh, and it looks like one of our special guests um, is going to be joining us, like I said, soon. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and start with Jessica. And, and I'm going to just uh, ask you the first question, which is, um, what is Hispanic Heritage Month? I know a lot of folks um, think it might be one thing and it's really not. Uh, kind of addressing those misconceptions of what it is and what it isn't and, and why we celebrate it. Sorry to kind of put you on the spot there. Pat. <laughs> That's okay. I'm happy to jump in. And when our other guest arrives, then they can share their thoughts in perspective too. Um, oh, I'll pause because I think he's arriving. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So once uh, he gets on, I'll have him introduce himself as well. Hello. How's it going? It is good. It is wonderful. How are you today? You know, um, I lost track of time because I was meeting with a potential funder and uh, they had a lot of questions about who we were and what we wanted to do. And so, uh, yeah. Wow. So you're about to get a double dose of that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. I, you know, it's, uh, explaining it to some folks is harder than others. And so I think that this one will be a little bit easier. So I appreciate being here and the flexibility and grace. And uh, what's up, Jessica? How are you doing? Good to see you. Hey, Edgar. Good to see you. Yeah. Awesome. 
Well, um, Edgar, uh, I'm Ariel. Um, we did do some of our introductions, but we would love to get to know you as well and all of our guests get to know you. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of what you do, your background and the wonderful organization that you're a part of, we'd love to hear more. Absolutely. So uh, again, I'm Edgar Palacios. Uh, I am the founder of the Latinx Education Collaborative and we are in Kansas City. Um, we work on increasing the representation of Latinx educators in K-12. We think that it's incredibly important. Um, I got a shout out team, Susana Lizarras, um, who is our VP of Educator Supports, and Lexi Rios, um, who is our operations specialist. And so um, excited that over the next couple of weeks and months, like we're going to be able to um, add new team members as well. And so um, we're really, you know, rooted in increasing the representation of folks and so of our community. And so uh, happy Hispanic Heritage Month, by the way, in case you're not celebrating yet, uh, I encourage you to do so. You got another three weeks, probably. Um, so happy to help with that as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I was just asking Jessica right before you joined on. Um, our first question is, what is Hispanic Heritage Month and what it is, what it isn't? Are there any misconceptions and why do we celebrate it? Why do we honor this and recognize it? And, and yeah, so I would love to hear from the both of you. I know Jessica was getting ready to start and then I'll move over and you can answer right after her. Perfect. I think for me, um, as someone who grew up in the U.S. and in Kansas City, and, and to be honest, around a very like white dominant culture and, and around a lot of areas where I wasn't able to express my identity fully growing up, I think that Hispanic Heritage Month is always a time where I love to reconnect with my identity um, as being Latina, as being Mexicana, as being all these things, like what that means to me. And um, I always remind myself to find the beauty and in my heritage and in my culture and affirm my identity and of the other Latina people around me this month. Um, so that's first and foremost, as someone who, who holds the identity of the month that's being celebrated, I love to just reconnect with my own identity and those around me celebrate together, get together with my family and friends and, and honor who we are, where we come from, what makes us who we are and where we are today. Um, and I think, it's also an opportunity for everyone else to learn. Um, there's so there's such a diverse Hispanic culture in Kansas City, and um, Black Dinidad cannot be defined by one group of people or one identity. And it's important to remember that this is a time for people who don't identify as Hispanic to listen and learn from people around you of what it means to them and and what leaders here are in Kansas City and and in the world that have that are continuing to make um, change in, in this moving our identity forward in development. And I think it's not something I wrote down. It's not a time to assume anyone's identity. Everyone's in a different place in their identity development and don't put people on the spot. Don't, if you don't have a relationship with them, don't just walk up and be like, Hey, like, what is, what is your identity or what is, you know, don't ask invasive questions and don't assume. It's also not a time to use cultural relics or artifacts in a performative way. Skip the sombreros, skip skip the um, posting your tacos or, what, or whatever you think um, is appropriate. It's not, don't, don't use those things if you're not Hispanic to honor this month. That doesn't honor Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, but instead, spend that energy listening and learning about Hispanic, Latina identity and culture throughout this month. Awesome. And Edgar, uh, same question for you. Um, any misconceptions and, and, and why, why do you feel like it's important to celebrate it? You know, that's a complicated question for me. And I just I want to root it into a couple of things. Um, First and foremost, I was born in Miami, Florida, um, where my parents uh, came from Nicaragua. So I am um, I'm a son of immigrants. Um, they came to this country fleeing war. Um, but I lived in Miami, Florida, which is sometimes known as the gateway to Latin America. And so for me, um, Latinidad was incredibly diverse and expansive, right? I knew, I knew folks from almost every Latin American country that ex exists. And um, I saw the diversity of our community. Um, and then I moved to Spokane, Washington and in Spokane, Washington, that was sixth grade. Like I learned how much 
people didn't understand of the community. Um, you know, I, 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 my parents from Nicaragua in Spokane, Washington, I was called Mexican. And, you know, it's when I started using, I started using the term Hispanic. Um, in Miami, I was Nicaraguense. In Spokane, I was Hispanic. Um, when I lived in Cape Girardeau, I was Hispanic in some other terms that I won't mention here, um, but that therapy has helped me kind of overcome. And then in Kansas City, I finally started using the term Latino. And then I started, yeah, I created an organization with the term Latinx. Um, and I also, I want to acknowledge that Jessica, um, if I'm hearing you say this right, you're using the term Latine. Um, and so there's an evolution of language, um, an evolution of who we are as a people and an understanding of our identity that continues to evolve. Um, I use the term Latinx today, um, not because of the dismantling of the gender binary, that's part of it, not because it can be considered an activist term, that's part of it, but I really love the X as a symbol um, for the incredible diversity of our community. And so, not one term is ever going to fully define who we are as a people. Um, and that to me is why Hispanic Heritage Month is important. Um, although I will say some bristle at the term Hispanic, some bristle at the fact that we're going to celebrate a month like this, um, some bristle at all these other things. But I think uh, to Jessica's point, it's whether we like it or not, whether it was designated by us or not, we have an opportunity to highlight and elevate the different voices of our community and to shine a spotlight on, on what it is to be um, Hispanic, Latino, Latine. Um, I heard Latino yesterday for the first time and it was interesting. Uh, I still have questions around it. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's about diversity. It's really about acknowledging the fact that um, Latinos in general transcend race, transcend nationality, transcend language, right? And so, we have to we have to come to terms with that as a community as well and so that's why that's why i think it's important to celebrate awesome i feel like i need to snap that and i'm learning so much also from the both of you uh and, and i love what the both of you said so i'm definitely feeling that um and i was gonna ask you what does it mean to you but you both address that and in, in in amazing beautiful ways so i don't have to to ask you that at all um and i appreciate that um so I want to ask just a quick follow-up <laughs> for people who are watching who do not identify as um Hispanic or um Latinx what would you say to to people who are learning and like the posture to have around these different terminologies knowing that not everybody does identify with Hispan like with a certain terminology, um, anything that you'd have to say about that. And as people are continuing to learn um, different terminology that comes around and how to engage with that. Uh, can I jump in? May I jump in? Um, I actually don't think it's any different than pronouns or assuming gender identity, right? And so if you want to know what term you utilize for the person that you're talking to, like if you have a relationship with them, just ask, how do you identify? It's a simple conversation, it's a simple question. I don't think I've ever like bristled or felt offended by like me telling folks how I identify. Um, and I will tell you that tw I think 26 Latin American countries, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, we all have unique terms for our, our, our communities as well. So Nicaraguenses are Nica, uh, Costa Ricans is Ar Artico, um, Puerto Ricans are Boricuas, you know, so like there's also colloquial terms and whatnot in these spaces. And so I don't expect people from the community to understand that because <laughs> sometimes people from within the community don't understand that, right? So we still have some education within our own folks. What I will say is, um, this hesitation around like, how do we call people? I think is easier, is, is easily mollified by saying, hey, how do you identify? And then giving them space to, to, to let you know. I 100%, oh, sorry, Edgar. I 100% like build on everything Edgar said and agree. I think that it's also important to recognize that when you grow up where the culture wants to prescribe your identity for you, there is power in claiming an identity, but it also has room to evolve. Like I give myself space to allow my identity to evolve because for so long I was told 
this is who you are. This is how you should identify. This is what your name means. This is who, you, this is where you come from, from my own family, from friends, from communities that I grew up in. And finally, I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to determine for myself what my identity is. And, and I've been identifying as Lat Latina, Latinx for a long time. And then I've recently been in conversation about this term Latine and what that means. And, and it just feels better on my tongue. I like saying it more like this is something that I love how Edgar, you know, talks about what Latinx means to him. And I think Latine is also an opportunity to reclaim the language and the identities um, that Latinx doesn't flow as well in Spanish and these other things. And, and so I think giving grace and space for, for people whose identity may have been prescribed to them for a long time to also change, grow and evolve and have that space and grace as well. So when, if you met me a year ago, I would have said something different than what I'm saying now and, and that's okay. Um, and so just keeping that in mind as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, and, and so with, with this, like how do, how do you feel like um, your identity and, and the approach that you take on identity, how do you feel like that um, impacts education? Does that make sense? How, how does that approach impact education with, with identifying? And I heard you say grace and space as well. So how does that, how do you navigate through that within education? I can jump in here. I think as a teacher and as a student, I was thinking about this question of like all the stuff we internalize when we're children growing up, we live in a Eurocentric white world and that sends us messages about who we are. That sends black and brown students messages about who they are. And I think a lot about undoing harm and undoing generational like pressure and this idea like Latinidad and, and my identity specifically carries a lot of like assimilation pressure. I think there, I had to undo a lot of pressure to assimilate to a, to a white Eurocentric norm um, and instead demand and take up space as who I am fully. And I, I believe in creating that space for our students as well. Every time you're in a classroom in front of students, you have an opportunity to undo any of the harm that society is perpetuating to them, especially black and brown students today in this world. They are living in a world that does not always give them space to fully live out their identity. And your classroom can be a space where that's the opposite, where they're fully given grace and space to explore their identity and be fully who they are um, and push themselves into even a deeper understanding of, of what they believe about themselves and their culture and their heritage and all of those things. Um, and so I just really view the classroom as a space where all identities are valued, honored. And, and during Hispanic Heritage Month, how am I honoring my Latine students? How am I I'm not putting them on the spot, but how am I encouraging them to take time to reflect on who they are, their identity? Um, what pride do they have in their identity? What do they, what do they find beauty in? Um, all of those, all of those things. This month is such a beautiful time to do that in your classroom. I think growing up, I never had, I never had a Hispanic teacher. I was never represented in my identity, which is what I love about the Latinx Education Collaborative is that that's their entire mission is to make sure that Latina kids have teachers who represent their identity. I never had that. So what does that mean when I'm standing in front of my students and saying, I'm proud of who I am. This is what this means to me. This is how I honor my ancestors, my culture, my identity. And this is how that looks for me. And for my non-Hispanic students, that's, that's beautiful for them too, because they're seeing a teacher get to fully take up space in who they are and so how are we giving in our students that space as well? Awesome. And Edgar, did you have anything additional that you wanted to add to that at all? No, I think Jessica summed it up really well. Um, I become a little bit more radical. And so I'll reserve that for like later questions. <laughs> okay. Andrew, did there, are there any follow-up questions to that or any questions on the live that we need to address based on that? Um, no questions in the live at this point, but yeah, I think, thank you for, for sharing. And I think that's really impactful knowing of honoring your student's identity, whether or not you have the same identity as them. Um, and also honoring doesn't mean putting them on the spot or putting that pressure on a student to hold the weight of 
that month or educating you or the classroom is um, a great highlight. Yes. Um, so get away with the next question, Ariel. Yeah, that's a great segue. Thank you. <laughs> um, the next question I was going to ask is just basically how how do you feel like teachers um, and or educators and, and administrators, how do we approach and highlight diverse months? Um, whether you identify uh, with that with that month or or you don't, how without like Andrew said, without putting them on the spot and without being um, without cultural appropriating and feeding into these stereotypes, how do you, what would be the best way to start that process uh, for either one of you? Um, I will say that um, I heard this from Dr. Miguel Guajardo one time, um, and he said the invitation is so important. And so inviting people to share about their identity and who they are and where they come from is different than putting them on the spot. Um, giving them choice is incredibly important in that conversation. And so, um, and invitation is, is cr critical there. Um, two, you know, I think a lot of us get stuck in perfectionism and this idea that if we're not gonna do it right, then we probably shouldn't do it. And so we're more afraid of the mistakes that could happen than like the beautiful outcomes that could happen. And so I think I'm gonna refuse to believe at this point um, and, 2021 that like you can't google um a simple question like how do i how can i celebrate hispanic heritage month like i think the resources are there um and if you need people to help execute on that i think that there are organizations like the lec and others who are doing that work and so i don't know i tend to think differently about that um if if you serve in a school that has a large if you serve in a school period and you can you understand who your students are like it's probably good practice to make sure that they feel like they belong in these spaces and how do you make people feel like they belong you see them in the in the literature you see them on the posters you see them in the language that's available and so these things are not difficult um they just take a little bit of internet internet intentionality um and the willingness to ask like how can i do it sometimes you just have to Google it and like make it work. Um, and sometimes like you can engage other folks in the conversation and invite them to say, like, how would you do it? You know, I know that you are Latina. I know that you're Hispanic. I know you're this. Um, and we want to celebrate and support you. How can we be doing that as a school, not just through October, September 15th through October 15th, but what can we be doing that throughout the year as well? Yes. Um, Go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> Round of applause for Edgar all around. Like if you at this point in, in your educational career are not making space for things like this, like you need to reevaluate. I mean, as harsh as that sounds, like please reevaluate because that means that not every child in your classroom is getting an opportunity to feel seen. And that's, that's critical to this job, to this work. Just one really quick thing I did as a teacher that I thought, was really impactful for, for all my students, my, my Hispanic students and my non-Hispanic students. Every day during Heritage Months, I kept, uh, we did a little lesson on um, someone in history or who's alive today who holds that identity, who they are and what difference they've made in the world. And I took recommendations from my Latina, Lat um, Hispanic students about who they wanted to learn about, who they wanted to um, teach the class about if they wanted to teach them or if I found resources about them. It literally took two, three minutes at the beginning of class. YouTube has a ton of resources that are like two or three minute biography videos about all of these change makers in, in, in all different communities. I did that not only for Hispanic Heritage Month, but Black History Month, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, Indigenous Peoples Month, Pride Month, like the, for all of them. Like how are we learning from and about the people that our trailblazers within those communities. My student from Honduras, um, I'll never forget, she wanted to learn about Rigoberta Menchu. I, I didn't know who that was. And I learned from her who Rigoberta Menchu was. And we as a class learned about her and the difference that she made for indigenous communities in Latin America. And so just allow your, your, your students to have a voice too. They're creative, they're smart. They, they also have um, ideas, they have brilliant ideas incorporate them. Think about your students' families too. You have so many resources. 
they are experts in their own identity. Sorry, my dog is barking. They're they're experts in their own identities too. Could could you bring in a student's family who wants to teach you about their culture, their identity? Um, what what resources do you already have at your disposal in the community in your classroom that you could highlight um, and bring in for your students? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrea, any follow-up questions or anything before I didn't want to jump and then maybe you have. Yeah, no, no. I think it, you know, great highlighting both of you of it's not just this one month to put out and empowering that um, there's well, your students have things to bring to the table. I think sometimes in the higher conversation there can at large, there can be um, this perception of perfection that people put on themselves, especially white people or people who are not a part of that identity to make it, um, well, I can't do it as an excuse. And I think knowing that you can take two or three minutes to ask something um, to engage and taking a step is better than um, disengaging because ultimately um, it's about your students and the impact of them, not about you and getting it. Um, right for your own performance. Um, so I loved what both of you said. And there are so many great resources out there, LEC being one of them, uh, for um, um, to be sure to check that out and the work that um, uh, Edgar and the team is, is doing. All right. Well, um, uh, I think uh, Jessica just stepped away for just a moment, but Edgar, um, I'd like to ask you, you know, I want to bring it and circle it back to Kansas City as well. Um, and I want to just kind of look at Kansas City in the terms of what do you wish people in Kansas City knew about, about Hispanic Heritage Month and about LEC and, and, and the movement and what we're trying to do here in Kansas City? You know, I, that's a that's a really complicated question, and I think my answer shifts based on like how I feel in the moment, right? Um, I'm gonna say this. Um, I think we have a ways to go um, around Hispanic Heritage Month in terms of uplifting it and celebrating and finding the joy. Um, and you know, Black History Month to me is like a really powerful moment of celebration for Black identity. Right. And it feels like everyone's talking about it. It feels like everybody's invested in it, you know, and I don't know if I have the same energy or I feel the same energy for Hispanic Heritage Month yet or not. I could be wrong, but I'm creating space for like this, like, I wish it were more full in a way. Right. Um, so that's one thing. What I want people to learn about Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, you know, I think so the basics as to like why it starts on the 15th. You know, why, 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 you know, like we go to the 15th of October, you know, um, this idea around like we had a taco bar at school and, you know, we uh, wore sombreros in Spanish class and like that's how we celebrated. Like, I don't know, like there, there are opportunities there that yeah, I, we just, uh, we have to remove some stereotypes or we have to rethink about some stereotypes we have around the Hispanic Latino um, culture. Um, and so I, I always just challenge folks to just think a little bit more deeply about um, how to bring in voices. Um, I think some teachers do a phenomenal job of inviting folks in into their classrooms. And like, But I also think like it's it, sometimes it feels like a last minute thing. And so we're, you know, it's September 14th. We've had a recognition that Hispanic Heritage Month starts tomorrow. And so hey, I'm going to send you a quick email because you're the only Latino person I know. Um, and can you come into the classroom and talk about these things, right? And so I wish that there was a little bit more intentionality behind the ask um, sometimes. Um, I recognize that everybody's busy and so I grant space for that. Um, and, you know, around the LEC, like we're learning as an organization. Like we actually don't have all the answers in this space. Um, we have some ideas and some solutions and some offerings that we want to bring to the table. But at the end of the day, like Jessica is who we want to support. Like Jessica has a solution. Jessica is working in the classroom. She deals with these topics every day. She shows up in her identity every day and she's modeling the way for, for students, right? And so 
my bigger concern with an organization is like, how do we support Jessica and someone like Jessica um, in their own identity journey? You know, how do we create the space for them to fully be free in, um, in who they are and what they're bringing to the table? Um, and this element of pride in, who, in their identity, right? Because I think that when that happens, um, students see that and they model that and they feel that and then they start feeling like they belong, which means that they have better educational outcomes long term. Um, and so, yeah, I think that fortunately or unfortunately, like Jessica is our solution, right? Like investing in her as an educator and supporting her and her and her just in her own identity journey is like what we want to do because that is what we wrestle with as a community. I love that. I love that. I also love how you said that you want it to feel more full. Um, and I know that you mentioned that you lived in Miami and then you also lived in Washington. I lived in Florida for like seven years and I can definitely feel that like fullness when I'm there compared to being in Kansas city, which is why, you know, I'm all, I'm all for it. And I'm like, what do we need to do? What are the resources? How can we make it feel more full? Um, it's like, it's one of those things that touches your heart where you're like, yeah, how do we make it feel more full? Why does it go from the 15th? You know, like, why does it start? Why doesn't it start at the beginning of the month? Why does it start when it starts? Why does it end when it ends? Um, so those are all awesome questions that I don't even think that people even think about um, as far as like, oh, why does it start on the 15th? And I don't even know if I asked myself that question. It's just kind of been something that I've known. And I'm like, oh, it starts here. This is when it starts. But I've never asked the question of why at, at, at all. Um, Can I just uh, jump in? And yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take the space too much, but I I was over um, earlier this morning at um, the Royal Seconds of their DEI uh, committee around Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I asked the team who was there of like, why is the Royals color blue? And I asked, I was like, does anyone here know why like they chose blue as their color? And the team didn't know, they weren't aware. And then entered a gentleman who was familiar with that history, right? And so the Royals chose the color blue because at some point the owners, the original owners, um, um, had um, horses that they would race and the horses like I don't know what do you like the outfit <laughs> of the horses were blue and like you would think it's because royal blue you would think of other things but I was shocked to hear that the royals made the, their color decision based on the fact that I think the Kaufmans really appreciated horse racing and that they would dress their horses in blue. And that's how they've honored that history. Um, and I think that that moment of me asking them is also why it's important to have these conversations because we often don't know our history. We accept things as they are. We accept that Hispanic Heritage Month starts on the 15th of September and goes through October 15th. Some of us don't ask why that is. Right. And so when we don't ask the why around this conversation, we lose the meaning. And so part of that, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month starts on the 15th because five countries, um, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica, they unsubscribed from Spain. You know, they said, we're not going to do this today. And they decided to make a change. Right. Sometime in 1824, I think they were like, we're out. Um, and then Mexico. Independence Day is on September 16th. It's not Cinco de Mayo, as a lot of us assume. It's on the 16th of September. And they were like, we're done too, Spain. Um, and then Chile happens a couple of days after that, right? Um, and so it's in that history that we are often deprived of um, that we forget the meaning of like why we're here and why we exist and how we ended up here, which then erases the way we feel about why we belong in these spaces, right? And so that's just an offering that I have today based on that story around why the Royals chose blue as their color. Thanks for sharing that and that connection to the importance of knowing the history of, um, of this month and just for people knowing their own history and, and background and connecting that together. That's really powerful. And can I add one thing in there? Definitely. <laughs> I'm getting it. I'm, I'm loving it. 
One thing that I would push people to ask themselves if they're in positions of power is just like, who's, whose voices are at your table? Like, who, who are you asking? Who are you talking to? Who are you listening to? And when I mean positions of power, I'm also talking about educators in the classroom. You're in a position of power with your students. I'm talking about instructional coaches. I'm talking about school building leadership. When you're thinking about these things, who are you talking to? And how can you disrupt these power dynamics that tell us whose voice matters? How can you just, maybe you think, oh, the only person I know to reach out to is someone, a CEO of a company in Kansas City, and I need them to come in and talk about Hispanic Heritage Month because they're the expert. You have experts in your school building. I can guarantee you that. You have experts in your students. You have experts in your students' families. And how are you tapping into the expertise that already exists? You, I guarantee you have business owners in your family. I guarantee you one of your students' families owns a business, owns something, can come in and talk about that with your students and your school. And I would just push everyone to think through, like, if you think you don't know any Hispanic people in positions of power, you're wrong. Look around your school, but also share that power within your school. If you're a school building leader, get your teachers at the table who are Hispanic or Indigenous during Indigenous Peoples Month or AAPI during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Like, get those voices at the table. Get your students at the table. Ask them, include them, include their families and what they need and how you can honor their identities because they're the best advocates for themselves. They know that they know themselves the best. And so how can you get their voices present? You don't need to have as, as amazing as Edgar is, this is a super busy month for him. You don't need to have Edgar come in and talk to your school. You have experts within your building. Edgar is amazing. So are your students and their families. So are your Latina, Latinx, Hispanic teachers share that with them, get their voices at the table and step back and listen because they, they know and they can they can support there. Wow, wow. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Edgar. Um, definitely loved everything that you said. Uh, I know that I think too often we skip past, like you said, the students, the teachers, their families, um, and, and how much of an expert we are within our own cultures and how you can utilize those resources where it doesn't have to be you know, someone that holds a certain status either um, or a level of status that, that we're putting them at. It can be someone that you know, that's right around the corner that you just miss out on and they might have this amazing story that you're not even letting breathe, you know? Um, so yeah, so with that, thank you for both of those. Um, are there any resources, uh, local resources that you feel like are here in Kansas City that, that you want people to, to, to come, to go to, to be a part of, um, to donate to, to just like to just love all on? Uh, and I'm going to take notes because I would love to be able to, to support and, and be a part of those resources. Just so Edgar doesn't have to toot his own horn, first I want to say as a, as a Latina educator in Kansas City, the Latinx Education Collaborative has been incredible. Their support of Latinx teachers, the research that they're doing in Kansas City, the, the, the way that they honor and celebrate the educators to ensure that there's representation in Kansas City classrooms is just phenomenal. Um, if you don't know them, look them up. If you haven't read about them, if you know a Latinx teacher who isn't connected with them, connect them. Um, the, the support that they provide is just unmatched and unparalleled in Kansas City to Latine Hispanic teachers. Uh, so before Edgar has a chance, I just want to highlight and spotlight the LEC because they, the, the speakers they bring to Kansas City, the conferences they put on, the things that they do are just unparalleled to anything I've experienced and in support I've experienced otherwise. So I just want to highlight the LEC. Of course, of course. Edgar, anything from you? I, I know we're I'm trying to I'm here. trying to stop from like crying. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take a second to pause and just like, like breathe through that. So uh, Jessica, I appreciate that. And I receive that. And um, thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I came to Kansas City in, in 2004. And at that time, um, I wasn't truly really aware of what the Latino community was here in Kansas City. Like, I had no no connections to it yet. And like I hadn't built my infrastructure yet. And so I think that we have really great institutions here. Um, I think about El Centro um, in KCK. I think about um, Guadalupe Centers in, um, here, here on the West side. I think about Maddie Rhodes. Um, I think about the Hispanic Development Fund. 
You know, I think about the Latino Arts Foundation. I think about um, the Hispanic Development, um, the HEDC, the Hispanic and, um, Development Economic Corporation. I'm saying that wrong. Um, Economic Development Corporation, HEDC, um, the Hispanic Chamber. Um, there, these are organizations that exist and are um, playing their role and their part in supporting our community. And so and those are folks who have been around too for a while. Um, and so they exist and it's, it's, it's important not to forget that they are, uh, that they're not there, right? That they actually do really incredible work. And so those are places that you can engage. There are a lot of community leaders as well. Um, that, like Jessica said, you know, like anybody can be a leader if only invited to it or asked and right. And so um, there's a lot of great people out there doing work that don't have big organizations or have notoriety or have any type of fame, but they're doing the work every single day. Um, I just met a new person a couple of weeks ago, Phyllis Hernandez, who um, runs the Sala de Arte in Northeast. And so it's a new kind of gallery um, in the Northeast, right, of all, of all places, um, as I've heard some people say. And so like people are doing the work bringing and infusing their identity into the space and elevating it. And so um, there's not a comprehensive list out there, but there are definitely institutions that can help connect you to the right people. And also know that people themselves are great resources. And so we have a lot of experts in the room and that's, that's fantastic. Wow, wow. Andrea, any, any, I, you came off mute, so I'll let you go. <laughs> there, it, I just wanted to add, um, you know, you all are getting a lot of love and some comments. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to the history, the intentionality is key. Um, and highlighting people, yeah, being experts of their own culture and leaning on them versus um, having to come through um, just an institutional model or be a, a official um, that people carry their own expertise and experience. And that should be honored as well. So just wanted to highlight um, getting some love on, on the live. Yes, yes. Um, and so that that's all the questions I have for you all, uh, for the both of you. I say you all, Andrea, just in case I have any questions for you too, but that's all the questions I have for the both of you. Um, I definitely 100% appreciate you both taking out the time to come and, and speak. Uh, is there anything else that either one of you want to add about Hispanic Heritage Month? Um, any upcoming events that you definitely want to shout out and highlight? Um, or is there anything else at all that you want to say? Because fill me up because I'm getting full here and I'm loving it. So um, I'm going to shout out Jessica because she actually it was sometime during like the two months that we've been in a pandemic. Um, and I say two months because like time, right? Um, Jessica supported um, us by coming in and speaking to uh, future aspiring educators. Um, and Jessica taught me a couple of things around wait time and Zoom engagement that I still utilize in meetings. Um, and so she, I, I picked up from her directly, like, show me a thumbs up if you're feeling good. Like, she was modeling in a way, right? She, she made that engagement session so fun. And like, the students had nothing to say, nothing it's like nothing but fun, phenomenal, great things. Like this is the most fun I've had in a while on Zoom and that kind of stuff. And so um, I want to shout her out for that because her influence is felt in this organization today. Um, I will also say Evolucion. It's going to be our fourth year conference, also virtual, October 23rd, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and everyone is welcome. Um, it is a Latino space. So you're going to feel uh, you're going to feel what it means to be Latino, at least. And so um, if you're if you're prepared for that, you are invited and you're welcome to join us. And so I can put the link on wherever the chat is. But um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and join you all in this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, out. No, you're good. I'm like, yes, we'll um, be sh we can share that link on this live and then also on our social media for other educators and people that follow us to know. Um, about that coming up in October. Yes. Uh, Jessica, any any last words or anything from you as well? Y'all are both getting a lot of love. So if there's anything else, if you want to shout Edgar out again, I'm all for it. <laughs> of course, always. The last thing I want to say is just for us to remember that in an ideal world, 
we are celebrating identities all year long. We, we don't need Hispanic Heritage Month to honor the identities of our Latina Hispanic students. We don't need Black History Month to celebrate Black identities in our classroom. We don't need those months. However, we live in an imperfect world where it is very easy to overlook, it is easy to forget, it is easy to not center those voices and therefore use this month as a reminder. If you identify as Latina, Hispanic, any of those identities, take this month to reconnect with yourself. Who are you? What does this mean? Who are your ancestors? What did they do? What power do you hold within yourself from your ancestors and who they made you today? What they overcame to honor their identity to say, peace out Spain, I am my own, I am my own identity, I am my own culture. And how can you connect with that power? How can you connect with the power of your ancestors? How can you ensure that you are sharing that with your students, whoever you're in, in community with? It doesn't have to be students. Who are you in community with that you can share that with? This should be happening all year, but that doesn't mean that we can't honor this month. That doesn't mean that we can't sit down and be intentional in this month with our identities and who we are and sharing that with our communities. Um, it should be a year long celebration, but it's also okay to spend 30 days highlighting yourself, connecting with yourself, being proud of yourself and sharing that out um, and living. Th this world steals too much of our joy. Carry that joy around this month. Carry that joy around, carry around the power of your ancestors, carry around the power that you hold within yourself and just live it out and let it shine. And yeah, that's all I got. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, uh, I think that that's it. I think we're good. This was awesome. Um, I know we were taking notes, so I'm definitely going to be tagging a lot of the uh, organizations that you all said. I'm going to share this out again on our Instagram uh, for folks that weren't able to catch it on our Facebook. And if I can share it on our LinkedIn, I'm probably going to do that as well, because I definitely think that this conversation is important and needs to be heard um, and needs to be felt because I felt it. Um, and so, yeah, I thank you both of you so much for taking out the time. Thank you, Andrea, for moderating the comments and, um, and doing any follow-ups. So thank y'all both. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you, Edgar. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.